and um, Kevin will mute us all and off we go. So it really is uh, lovely to see you all for our worship this morning on this uh, third Sunday in Advent. You're very welcome and I'm pleased you've managed to log on. So grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And we're going to um, continue by lighting the third Advent candle and hopefully we'll be able to hear it. So here we are on this third Sunday of Advent in All Saints Church in Rothbury. So we have our first two candles already lit. The first, the patriarchs, the second, the prophets. The third, which we light today, where we focus on uh, John the Baptist, uh, preparing and proclaiming the Saviour who was to come. People of God, return. You are called to be God's own. From the mountains announce the good news. God comes in justice and peace to all who follow his ways. You are God's children. Lord, make us one in the peace of Christ today and forever. Amen. Amen. So may we, we, listen, may we listen to God's messengers all around us as we prepare to greet Jesus at Christmas and when he comes again in glory. So we sing our opening hymn on Jordan's bank, the Baptist's cry. So we can prepare our hearts for the joy of Christmas by cleansing them of guilty memories. God is always prepared to forgive when we admit our failings, so let us confess them now. We have dimmed the light of the world with our foolish fears. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We have cried out in anger instead of compassion for others. 
Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. We have allowed the world's commotion to muffle the Spirit's voice. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Collect for Advent 3. O Lord Jesus Christ, who at your first coming sent your messenger to prepare your way before you, grant that the ministers and stewards of your mysteries may likewise so prepare and make ready your way by turning the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, that at your second coming to judge the world, we may be found an acceptable people in your sight, for you are alive and reign with the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now Richard will unmute himself and bring our first reading. what this means. Lost the sound. At first I was thinking it was just me who can't hear, but I don't think that is the case. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, I can see people nodding. Um, Richard, I wonder if you could mute yourself and unmute yourself and we'll try again because uh, the sound didn't come through. So if we give it one more try, uh, Richard, and then I will, uh, I'll read it if, it if it doesn't work. So could you try it again? Yeah, should we try that? Is that better? That, that's great. Now it's working. <laughs> okay. So the first reading is taken from Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 to 4 and 8 to 11. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland in ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give him their recompense. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants, their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God, 
for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, and as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as the garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God shall, will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Richard. We got there in the end. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with songs of joy. Then said they among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has indeed done great things for us and therefore we rejoiced. For again our fortunes, O Lord, as the river beds of the desert. Those who sow in tears shall reap with songs of joy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. And we now sing our next hymn, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending.
Now Wilma will bring our gospel reading. A reading from St John's Gospel. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said, now they had been sent from the Pharisees, they asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptized with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thank you, Wilma. And now John will bring our reflection. Thank you, John. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? The church marks the season of Advent as a time for waiting. Christmas is approaching and we wait patiently and prepare ourselves for the coming of Christ. The world around us marks the season of Advent as a time for waiting too. Christmas is approaching and with presents under the tree, we are made to wait patiently some more patiently than others, for the joy of opening those gifts on Christmas morning. And 2020 has given us a new understanding and appreciation of waiting. The vaccine is approaching, but we mustn't deluge our surgeries with demands for it. We must wait with patience. We will receive it, but not just yet. And what, are we, we, what we are really waiting for, of course, is not the vaccine, but rather the promise of normal life. Everything we are told will get back to normal. And in the midst of all this, we Christians wait for the coming of Christ. But I wonder which coming we have in mind. At the risk of spoiling the surprise, if you are waiting for a baby to be born in a manger, a baby who will be the salvation of all mankind, if that's the coming of Christ that you are waiting for, the first coming, then I'm afraid you're late for the party, about 2,000 years late. Not, of course, that we shouldn't celebrate the mystery of the incarnation when God became one of us and lived among us, with all our human frailty. But if all we are waiting for is to celebrate a historical event, I think we may have missed the point. So are we waiting for the second coming, when Christ will come again and God's kingdom and the salvation of mankind will be fulfilled, when he will manifest his glory in the world of course we are. In the creed we confess our faith that he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. But Christians have been waiting expectantly for Christ's return for 2,000 years, and who knows how long we will have to go on waiting. Rather, I suggest, we are waiting for what St Bernard of Clairvaux calls 
the middle coming of Christ. The coming of Christ hour by hour, day by day, on every day and at every hour, into our hearts, into our minds, into our lives. Relentlessly, faithfully, Christ comes to us and he fills us with his grace to go out into the world and to do his work. St John the Baptist was waiting for the coming of Christ, one whose shoe he was not worthy to untie. But he did not do his waiting by sitting at home. Rather, he went out calling the people to repentance of their sins and baptising them in the River Jordan. He went out to be a witness, to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. How very frustrating it must have been for the Jews of Jerusalem to receive John's string of refusals. No, he isn't the Messiah. No, he isn't Elijah either. No, he isn't another one of the prophets come again. What then? The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. John's mission as the forerunner of Christ is to call the people to a recognition of God's law, to demand that God's justice be done on earth, to prepare the way for the coming of our Lord and Saviour. John cried out in the wilderness, not just literally, not just by preaching in the Judean desert, but figuratively too. He cried out into the wilderness of a people who had forgotten what God really wanted for them, who were placing their secular desires, ambitions, needs even, ahead of an obedience to God's divine justice and love. 2020 has given us, among other things, the term new normal. We have, quite rightly, been convinced to accept remarkable restrictions on our movement, on our freedom, on our lives. We have done so knowing that it is in pursuit of a greater good, the health of the more vulnerable and a return to normal. In the midst of the crisis, we have witnessed remarkable acts of selflessness from our health services and frontline workers, remarkable acts of love and generosity in our communities, remarkable cooperation between nations in pursuit of a cure. And now the vaccine is approaching. But less than a week after the approval of a first vaccine for use in the UK, we read that many of the world's poor will not receive a vaccine because the richest nations are hoarding it, buying up in some cases up to five times their needs. In pursuit of the normal, are we going to sacrifice justice? Are there not perhaps elements of the new normal, both globally and closer to home, that we prefer? Is this not the perfect opportunity to address the injustices that are endemic to our society? Christ comes to us today and every day and empowers us to be, like John, witnesses to him in the world. To be voices crying out in the wilderness. To demand justice for all mankind. To build his kingdom, not in the end times, but now in our own times. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, the Lord loves justice and he sends us all to bring good news, to proclaim liberty and release, to comfort and to provide. He promises that when we do these things, we will build up the ancient ruins and raise up the former devastations. And the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. 
like John the Baptist, in our witness, we will testify to the light so that all might believe. And so let us pray that 2021 may be a year of the Lord's favour, one in which all mankind can truly recover from the impact of this terrible disease, one in which love and justice flourish, one in which God's glory shines across his world. That is a new normal worth waiting for. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. We now affirm our faith in the words of the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now Colin will lead us in our intercessions. As children of God through faith, we come to our Heavenly Father, trusting that our prayers will be heard and God's purposes will be fulfilled. We pray for the church throughout the world, for our Diocese of Newcastle and our parish of Upper Coquitdale. We pray for our bishops, Christine and Mark, and Archdeacon Catherine. We thank you for the ministry of our rector and local clergy, including our retired clergy. In these most difficult and testing times, may we all together bring comfort, joy and evangelism by spreading God's word. We pray for the church as it interprets the faith. May we all, through our words and actions, tell of the love of God. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our Lord. prayer. We pray that throughout the world, peace, justice, tolerance and understanding will prevail. We pray for Her Majesty the Queen, the royal family and our government, who continue to be challenged by the pandemic, climate change and environmental concerns. We pray for all refugees, migrants and those who have fled their homes seeking a safer and better life. We pray for all who are homeless, sleeping rough and or going hungry this Advent. Also for all those who have lost their lives while attempting to escape tyranny and oppression and those who they left behind. We pray for the Brexit negotiations, that an outcome that is fair and just for all may be achieved. May all governments have the wisdom to do what is right in your sight. Wherever evil is at large and God's children live in fear and poverty, we pray that it may be resisted. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all who work in our health services, including those working in intensive care units, care homes and hospices. We pray for all who will seek work this winter, looking after the sick and the elderly. We give thanks and pray also for those 
who focused research has resulted in the first approved COVID vaccine. We pray for your guiding hand as the nationwide program of inoculations gathers momentum. We pray that ongoing trials of other potential vaccines will also prove successful. And the next spring will bring a return to a more normal life with families united again. Lord, in thy mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for students at universities and colleges who have endured a challenging term at college or university and will have or will soon return for Christmas celebration. We pray for students from overseas who will be spending Christmas in their student accommodation, far away from all family and friends. Also the lecturers, professors and researchers, and for all who are working to ensure the safety and well-being of staff and students. We pray and give thanks for our schools, and for the teachers who have worked hard to provide a safe and caring environment. Lord, in thy mercy. Hear our Lord. prayer. At this time, we pray for those working at home and those who have already lost or are once again fearful of losing their employment. As our political leaders, both local and national, strive to help others, we pray that their aspirations may be realized in a Christian way. We pray for next spring and Easter, when we may all be able to meet together and openly contribute to a peaceful and joyful community once again. Lord, in thy mercy. Hear our prayer. As Christmas approaches, we pray for local people families, those living alone, and all who may feel fearful, lonely, worried, or isolated by events and the changing restrictions. We pray for all who are unable to meet freely with family and friends at this very special time of year. We pray for those struggling with illness or adversity at this time. We thank you for the use of communication technology, which has brought us all together today. Lord, in thy mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those who have died and those who have lost loved ones recently, including those who have not been able to join mourners at funerals of friends and relatives. May all who grieve be comforted May all who feel isolated and alone find comfort in you through prayer. We give thanks for all who have gone before us, carrying the stories of our faith down the centuries. May those who have died recently find their place with those who have gone before them in the presence of Christ. Lord, in thy mercy, Hear our prayer. Gracious God, hear the prayers of our lips and the desires of our hearts, and be present with us, those who we love, and all those for whom we have prayed. Amen. Merciful Father, we ask that you accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for Lord thine Lord. is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. A closing hymn, Tell Out My Soul, The Greatness of the Lord. So now as you look for Christ's coming in glory, may you see the Father's love in creation's beauty and recognise the Holy Spirit in the kindness of strangers. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much for being with us this morning. Thank you, Kevin, for operating the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, thank you, John, for your sermon. Certainly worth waiting for. Thank you, Colin, for your uh, intercessions. Thank you, Wilma and Richard, for reading and for Jill for sitting next to me. It's been really good to be together. So you can now unmute yourself and we can chat. <laughs>